understand what can cause a problem and what can't cause a problem, whether it be medicines, solvents, uh, different types of household items, bee stings, anything that you might be exposed to that really is hard for you to figure out what to do or what to think about, and you know you might not need to go to the emergency room, you just need information, this is a great place. So we're going to talk about the kinds of things that people ingest, and some intentional, some not intentional, some relate to things that really can be harmful and some don't. But what we do know is that there are a lot of things to talk about and we have some great people to help discuss the issues with us. We have Dr. Kathleen Clancy. She is a medical toxicologist. She's also an emergency room physician and she is an expert in many of these issues. Dr. Toby Litovitz. She is the founder and the medical director of the National Capital Poison Center, a really great organization and one that she has fostered, at least kept going through all these years, and you'll hear a little bit about what those difficulties can be. We have Nicole Whitaker. She is a uh, certified uh, poison information specialist. She's a, an RN, and she really helps people understand what's going on when they do have those kinds of problems. And we have Craig Dieterle, who is a great old friend, a colleague, someone with whom I, I trained many, many years ago. He has worked in a number of different settings. He's a physician assistant. Uh, he's been an emergency medical technician. And he has taught me everything I have to know about emergency medicine. Actually, when I was a medical student, he was the one who would take us out on ambulance rides and show us what was happening in the community. And, and certainly, he's had to encounter quite a few uh, of these unknown sorts of ingestion situations. He's also someone who now works with the Fairfax County Police Department, helping them understand some settings where there might be some toxic exposure. So we got great stuff. We have some people also in the audience here who are going to talk to us about what they've experienced with their own son. But Dr. Litovitz, give us some background on uh, the Poison Center and a little bit uh, about what you guys deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay. Well, you're right. People call about all kinds of things. And in fact, in a typical year, the Poison Center gets about 40,000 calls from people who have been exposed to a poison. We call those poison exposures, not poisonings. Because lots of times they're calling about something that might be toxic, might be a poison, but really it turns out in the dose that they took or the substance itself really isn't that poisonous. So about 40,000 poison exposures. Another 1,800 calls about their pet that's been exposed to something that might be poisonous. Another 16 or 17,000 questions. Just, you know, what should I do? Does this interact with that? I'm pregnant. Can I take this medication? What is this particular pill I just found in my teenager's pocket? Um, and then that, that brings us to a total of about 60,000 calls a, a year that come into the, into the center. And that's from the DC metro area, the 4.9 million people in the DC metro area. Um, those 60,000 calls generate about 90,000 outbound follow-up calls. So the Poison Center calls back to make sure that after advice is given, the patient understands what they were supposed to have done with that advice, that the patient's clinical course hasn't changed, and also to gather data, and we'll talk later about what we do with the data that we gather from those individual patients. So you, you have a pretty diverse type of call that comes in, and, and also we want to hear a little bit about when people call what kind of information they should have ready, of course, uh, to be able to describe what's going on and what they're seeing, because I'm sure a lot of people just panic and call. Um, Craig, you've been involved in this from the actual point of view of, of uh, the emergency room where you've worked and, uh, and from the ambulance where you've worked. Um, does the Poison Center have uh, any significance for you guys? Definitely, in, in both cases. From an EMS perspective, when we go on the scenes of overdoses, either realized or suspected, um, they become an instant ready source for us to be able to communicate with to get some preliminary insights. From an emergency department perspective, we have patients that come in obviously overdosed. We can use them as a consultant, as well as on those cases which aren't as plain, aren't as clear, they become yet another resource for us to, uh, to contact as well. And you say there are also a lot of environmental and occupational exposures that people have. Uh, and a lot of times it's hard for people to discern what's going on. So I imagine that when you, you get people who are coming in after some kind of noxious gas or other kind of chemical exposure, uh, are those the types of things you also deal with? 
Occupational environmental exposures are an important issue for poison control centers, especially you want to focus on the importance of every family having carbon monoxide detectors in every sleeping area of their home. But before we go into that, maybe we should talk about the more serious current issue, the button battery ingestion hazard. Yeah, and I understand that uh, it's a very important component of, of the preventive uh, kinds of things that you do there at the center. And we actually have a family that, that have had a real experience right. with uh, a battery ingestion. But let's say, sort of go back and give us a little perspective on how that all evolved when you walked into a room right. that you saw. Um, my son was um, 12 months old at the time, and um, I was in the room with him, and suddenly he started um, gagging, retching, choking. I gave him the Heimlich. He, you know, got sick, and I thought he was okay, but then it continued, so I called, we called the ambulance. Um, they came out, and by then he had kind of calmed down a little bit, so they left. And then he started retching again a couple minutes later, and um, I took him to the emergency room. So it went, were you there for that? I, I, I wasn't there. I got, I got the phone call at work, and she said, I think he's swallowed something, but I'm not sure. And so I was sort of curious myself, why do you think he swallowed something? And in the, in the uh, you know, conversation over the phone, she said, well, I'm going to take him to the emergency room now. And as she was leaving my uh, now, 13-year-old daughter, who was seven at the time, said, um, I'm missing a battery. And that was a clue that led her to um, mention it to the triage nurse at the emergency room that our son swallowed something. We don't know what it is. We think he swallowed something. We weren't even sure if he swallowed something. So we're going on very little information and sort of just gut. And in fact, the um, suspicion about the battery ended up being critical and potentially saving his life because uh, we had an EMT overhear the conversation and based on that he got um, into surgery very quickly where they, they removed what they found in the x-ray. In fact, it was the battery. Right. And so that was pretty fortunate that you have a daughter who was that observant, right, my God. Right, from her toy. Yeah. Um, and of course we have that x-ray right here. I'm not sure if it's easy to see, but uh, there is a little of transparency right there that's about a quarter sized right in the, the lower part of the neck of your one-year-old son mm -hmm. and um, so they took him to surgery and in fact it was a battery of course it looks like it could have been a coin right uh, it could have been just about anything and I guess it was fortunate that they could find it there. Um, how did he do after that I mean did the battery do any damage it, it did he had third-degree burns to his esophagus um, and the wall of his trachea Wow, so it really did some, it some did. chemical it damage did. of some sort there. Um, and we're going to have to hear a little bit about what happens when that, that occurs. How about in recovery, so that kind of injury, how long was it in his, uh, in his esophagus? How long had it? It was three hours. Three hours before and, it was taken right. out. And, uh, and then how long was he in the hospital after that? About a little over three weeks. A little over three weeks, wow. He was, he was intubated and... Um, on a paralytic for a week and the concern when you have that type of injury is that the esophagus would perforate. He never did perforate um, but um, you know the, the, the injury itself was so significant that um, he ended up in the PICU for, for three weeks at Georgetown. So and has he continued to have any residual problems from it? He, he's had some breathing issues he, when he gets a cold he has scar tissue, so it presents like a crew oh. asthma. Right. But, uh, wow. So you guys are really fortunate. Very He's very fortunate. That's very right. Lucky. And he That's should right. should be able to outgrow that. Pretty interesting. Uh, and certainly, it's it seems to be an area that you guys have started to focus on at the Poison Center as well. Very much so. In actually, we started in the early oh. '80s looking at battery ingestions because there just was no literature out there to direct us as to how to manage these cases, and we established a national battery ingestion hotline at the Poison Center. And as of this moment, we've handled more than 11,000 battery ingestions from all over the United States. Um, so we've seen all the different kinds of problems, but. About six years ago, we started noticing that the cases were getting a lot more serious. 
and that even though we weren't seeing more cases, those that we were seeing were worse than the ones that we'd seen previously. So previously, children were ingesting smaller batteries. They were ingesting button cells that were less than 20 millimeters diameter. And now, the case that was involved with this child and the case of the battery that's usually causing problems in these cases is a 20 millimeter lithium cell. It has on it an imprint code that's usually something like CR2032 or CR2025. That 20 means 20 millimeters. And the other two digits are the height in tenths of a millimeter. So when a parent sees that battery, they should be concerned that that's a battery that could lodge in the throat of a small child and could burn through the esophagus of that child in really just two hours. It could cause a serious problem in just two hours. And, you know, I'm sure it's something that, that spurs most people's curiosity. You can hold a battery in your hands. You can get it wet and hold it between your fingers. It doesn't burn your skin. Um, you know, it, it just seems like what, what could happen? Obviously, it's not there long enough to start to corrode and disintegrate. What's, what's the mechanism of injury that occurs with a swallowed battery? Well, what happens with the battery is that the battery actually is in contact with the liquid that's in the esophagus and with the liquid that's in the tissue of the esophagus. And so it, a bridge, a current bridge, is between the two poles of the battery, between the negative and the positive uh -huh. pole. And that current is what's causing the problem. It, but it's not really the current itself. It's what the current does to the liquid. The, the current hydrolyzes the liquid. And in the process of hydrolysis, it generates hydroxide, which is an alkaline substance. So you have the equivalent to a drop of lye forming in your child's esophagus. And that lye or that, that hydroxide that forms is going to burn through the esophagus. And the longer it's in there, the more serious the burn will be and the deeper it can be. Wow, so new batteries especially then, and those, uh, is it, they're, they're lithium, so they're more powerful, and now they're bigger, so they last longer, and they're stronger, and they're big enough to get lodged and not go through into the stomach, so they end up sitting there. Exactly, perfect storm. Big enough to get stuck, higher voltage, higher capacitance, so more electricity is generated, and as a result, it's generated faster, and hydroxides form faster, and that's why we have a problem now that we didn't have a decade ago. Right. And so in that situation also, if we see it go into the stomach, it typically then will pass through and you won't do anything to grab it because it's not going to get stuck. But you'll monitor those pretty closely. We do. We, when they're a large cell, we make sure that they pass out of the stomach in four or five days. Right. Um, most of the smaller cells are going to pass out without, without even being monitored. So we don't need to do subsequent x-rays. So there are a lot of different situations. So it's mostly toddlers or young children. It is. Um, so we are aware of 18 fatalities from the ingestion of these batteries and about 97 or 98 serious cases that have had debilitating injuries or permanent injuries requiring um, either surgical procedures or long-term use of feeding tubes or breathing tubes um, who've ended up with fistulas or, or holes between the esophagus and the trachea or fistulas between the esophagus and the large blood vessel, which right. then leaves, leads to a lot of bleeding and massive exsanguination and, and is usually fatal. So, Pretty, pretty astounding. Um, hearing aids, are they a problem too? Because I think that probably between watches and, and uh, some of the other things that everybody has ordinarily, hearing aids are a big uh, commodity out there. There are lots of them in households. Well, they are a very common source of ingested batteries, but they are not a common cause of problems because right. the hearing aid batteries are so much smaller, right. they usually don't get stuck. Now, the hearing aid battery can be a problem if you put it in the ear or in the nose and can lead to very serious burns um, in either of those locations. But generally, with swallowing, the hearing aid battery is not an issue. Right. So another toddler event. Usually, I guess, um, of course, hearing aids, you'd expect them to be in the ear, wouldn't you? Anyway, it, fascinating. And in terms of trying to find ways to prevent battery ingestions, are there suggestions or, or campaigns that are ongoing? Absolutely. So first of all, you realize you only have two hours to get this battery out before you have a problem. So you need the medical community to realize that there's a problem and to get batteries out quickly if there is a suggestion that a battery is um, caught in the esophagus. And you also need the parents to understand that this is a huge hazard and to keep batteries away from 
children or to know that if their child has swallowed a battery, it's an emergency and you need to get immediately to an emergency department. But what we found is that 62% of these children who have a problem with a battery ingestion have gotten the battery from a product directly. So the children are getting the battery out of the product themselves, which means that the closure on that battery compartment is not secure enough to keep a child out of it. So our focus from a standards setting perspective or regulatory perspective is to try to get product manufacturers to secure the battery compartments of all kinds of products that may have batteries, not just toys, they're already required to be secure, but all kinds of things. And one of the big problems with these 20 millimeter cells is that they're in remote controls, which even though you don't think of that as a toy, children will often handle them and you wouldn't keep it out of the reach of your child. Right. So a small remote control may in fact have a lithium cell in it and that's a major source. Other sources, <laughs> scales, um, uh, watches, calculators, thermometers, um, and then all kinds of things that you wouldn't even naturally think of like lighted shoes and flashing jewelry and um, glucose meters, fishing lures, um, you, you know, you, all these things that are powered in your house um, are likely to have a, a battery in them and that battery may in fact be a 20 millimeter lithium cell which is, which is an extreme hazard. And then even when you go out and you buy replacement batteries, you have c packages that may be hard to open the first time, but if you have multiple batteries in that package, sometimes you're just going to leave them laying on a counter or in a drawer. And I guess that's also another thing for parents right. so the to other be aware of. Sure. So we talked about 62% of children are getting it out of the product. Well, and there's another 30% that are getting it from batteries that are sitting out loose in the house. Mm -hmm. So those, th that's another instance where the parent can intervene and make sure that batteries are kept out of reach of children and that they are stored in a, in a safe area. Right. So Nicole, since we're talking about the young, uh, and I'd say since so many of these are toddler and younger type of uh, exposures, ingestions, or whatever, um, what are the kinds of things that you're most concerned with relative to educating and, uh, and encountering in the, the poison center with kids that age? Well, prescription medications are a huge problem. Um, they really need to be locked up. A lot of people do rely on the child-resistant cap as their sole source of keeping the child out of the medication. But the reality is children you know, do develop new skills every day, and so they do learn how to open these packages and are often more efficient at doing it than adults are. So um, these things need to be kept out of sight, out of mind, and um, make sure that when uh, visitors to the home come, such as grandparents coming in from out of town, that their medications are secured as well. And I, I guess a lot of them have arthritis and they uh, they're advised they should have the childproof bottles, but heck, they're living on their own in some senior community. Why would they have that when it's hard to open? So they have uh, easily opened little absolutely, caps. absolutely. And you know, people are on uh, medications like cardiac medications for blood pressure and um, medicines for diabetes. These are medications that we are very concerned about at the Poison Center, and um, we often think of being a huge problem in children with as little as one or two tablets. So right. it's important to keep those locked up. What percentage of the population, um, I guess, is on cardiac or some kind of psychotropic uh, medication? Probably between 30 and 40 percent. It sure seems that way. Yeah, now, it sure does. you know, <laughs> when, you, when, when we as the healthcare professionals contact people, those are people that tend to be on medicine, so we maybe have a skewed view, but it seems like at least 50 percent of the people you see as a patient is on either a, you know, a cardiac medication or a psychotropic medication. And those cardiac medicines, you know, they're designed for a specific purpose for a specific person. And if a person who doesn't have that problem takes it, like they're designed for a person with high blood pressure. And if a person without high blood pressure takes it, their blood pressure is going to go very low. Or the cardiac medicine could slow their heart rate down to a dangerous level. So there are some issues. And the antidepressants, things of that nature, uh, some of the... the very, very poisonous. I mean, there are some, some of the older ones were even more poisonous than the ones we have now. But at, uh, if people take more than a single, the single recommended dose, um, people can end up with uh, block, you know, cardiac blockade, blockade of the electrical activity that goes from the top of the heart to the bottom of the heart so their heart won't beat fast enough. 
They can have arrhythmias where their heart beats way too fast and they don't get enough blood pressure to their brain. So, Nicole, do you handle the calls that come into the center? I do. I am one of the specialists on the phone. And so when somebody calls and says, you know, I, I walked into the room and the bottle of some blood pressure medicine or some psychiatric medicine was opened and my, my child was there, what do you, how do you tell them? How, what do you advise them in that situation? Well, we're careful to ask the correct questions. And so we try to get information like, how old is the child? How much do they weigh? Are they having any symptoms? Has it been um, a certain period of time since they've gotten into it? And what kind of treatments have you done for them so far? We also like the parent to have the package with them when they call so that they can read to us from the bottle exactly what the name of the medication is and what the strength is. And then we estimate based on what the parent thinks is the worst case scenario uh, to determine based on the child's weight if it's a problem or not for that specific drug. So each call is tailored to the, each situation. So it's something where um, when you call, we're going to ask you a lot of questions, but it's so that you can get the best care for your child. And now uh, when you have people on the phone and you find out, okay, things are okay, we're going to follow up, or in any which way uh, when you advise them, it would seem logical then that you would ask them to date the day that they pick up the prescription and maybe even have the number of pills there. And if they're taking them on a regular basis, then they might have some sense of how many pills are in the bottle. Yeah, absolutely. We do often try to um, help parents uh, or callers count back from what they have left to what they're supposed to have and see if we can kind of narrow down the range of what perhaps the child has gotten into. Sometimes it's not possible. People have a lot of um, habits of things like um, taking new prescriptions and dumping them into old pill bottles so that they lose count. Some people don't take their medications regularly or it's a medication that they don't have to take every day but only as needed and so they don't keep track. And so in those situations, if we really can't narrow it down to a worst case scenario where we can be sure that the child is safe at home, then we will start to um, mobilize to get them into the emergency room. So, and people, when they travel, they tend to put everything into one little pillbox or, or whatever. Um, and I, I guess it can be a, a problem. But in the same vein, when we're talking about the, uh, the young ones, <clears throat> there are a whole bunch of medicines that are marketed towards young kids. Uh, it used to be cold medicines. And as they finally took a look at uh, the effectiveness of those things, uh, and discovered that really they didn't help symptoms. It was more of a subjective, I've got to do something for my kid's cold. Uh, but we started to see some odd mixtures that uh, actually created some big problems. In fact, I'm sure in the emergency room, uh, if you see some of those kids, they come in fairly loopy and people don't know what the heck went on and you get that history. And you're questioning, is it the sickness or is it the cure? Right. Of, of the <laughs> circumstances that have been the source of the problem. Yeah, so I mean, they take the Tylenol cold with a little triaminic and some Benadryl on top, and all of a sudden they've had a, a triple dose of antihistamine, and you wonder why you can't wake them up. Right, and that's the other thing. You really want to be careful about reading the labels, because especially with multiple uh, combination products, um, you're going to have the possibility of doubling up on the constituent drugs in each preparation. So you want to make sure that you're not dosing with the same medication in multiple preparations. Tylenol is another one, and just sort of sticking with the same vein of the, the child at this point. Um, they've changed formulations, and uh, maybe you can yes. give us a little insight as to what has happened there. So recently, acetaminophen, or uh, that's the active ingredient in Tylenol products, but a, a number of other pain and fever relievers out there, um, recently they have changed the infant preparations um, to be the same concentration as the uh, the children's preparation. So um, here we have an infant preparation and here is the children's preparation. The infant preparation is usually in the smaller container and it used to be dosed according to drops with a small dropper. Um, it used to be much more concentrated in order to get the medication without as much fluid for the smaller child and the ease of dosing. Um, it's also, uh, it also comes with a syringe so that it's easier to dose um, smaller children who have not mastered drinking out of the dose cup like the children's formulation. But now they are the same concentration and it's really important that parents understand that um, you really need to read the bottles 
uh, make sure you know how much you're giving and read the instructions carefully. And also to use the dosing tool that comes with the medication that you're dosing. Okay. Not to switch between different types of medications or even different formulations of the same medication because it may give you a different um, concentration if you're dealing with an older product with a newer syringe, something like that. You may overdose or underdose your child. And so if you think anything like that has happened, you can always certainly give us a call and we'll help you work through it. Well, that's good to know too. So if there are certain medicines you just aren't sure about on your medicine shelf, um, they can call and they can ask. Absolutely, and it doesn't have to be an emergency. You can certainly call. And I'm noticing something here anytime. too, which is uh, pretty interesting to me because uh, certainly as a pediatrician, I see a lot of these things, but they are uh, really comparing the uh, the tablets of certain medications to candies, which kids might become pretty familiar with fairly quickly. Whether it's a Skittle that looks like an Advil or an aspirin, or uh, an iron supplement that looks like an M&M. Um, and of course, I get calls all the time of the kids who find the vitamin jar. And uh, as much as it's impossible to get them to take them when you want them to, they'll eat the whole bottle when they you hide in the closet. To, right? They hide in the closet <laughs> with the bottle, yeah. <laughs> And can that cause a problem for them as well? Sure, depending on the kind of vitamins, but vitamins with iron have um, enough iron that if kids eat you know, large quantities, they can get sick from it. Right. Mostly our severely poisoned, uh, the patients severely poisoned with iron are people who've ingested the prenatal iron. The prenatal iron tablets have a lot more iron in them. But there, there's enough in those vitamins that kids can run into trouble if they eat a lot. Right. And, and so that can cause real injury to your, your stomach. And it sure your can. And, and of course, Tylenol, if taken in excess, uh, we know can cause some pretty significant liver problems. Absolutely. And it's probably one of the most common overdose medicines or the ones that people worry about being overdosed. I would agree. And, and the other thing about uh, acetaminophen products is by the time someone develops symptoms after an overdose, the liver damage is already being done. So it's really important that if you suspect that you've taken too much or you've dosed your child too much, um, give us a call early as soon as it happens and we can hopefully prevent the medication um, from being absorbed in the emergency room if we need to. Or there is also an antidote for acetaminophen poisoning um, that is very effective and very safe that can be given in the hospital if need be. It's not available over the counter. Unfortunately, no, not at home. Mm -hmm. So No, we don't want that. We want oh. to make sure we know what's going on. Yeah. Right. And we do have very strict um, guidelines as to how much a person can tolerate based on their body weight. And so if it's something that um, we know the amount and we can calculate, um, chances are we will be able to keep you or your child at home safely. But in the event that you have taken too much, then we do know the cutoff range where it is really the safest thing to do is to get to the emergency room. And we end up with adolescents as the next phase of life. And I would say that, that their spectrum of ingestion would be a lot more creative. It is very creative. Adolescents, uh, they like to take pills, you know, they sometimes have pill parties where they'll take all random pills that they can encounter. Cardio, you know, cardiac pills that they steal from their grandmother or Tylenol pills or any random assortment of pills. Just hoping they might do something yeah. to, for fun, right? Sure. And then there's a wide assortment of designer drugs that are out there, you know, the new K2 and spice and bath salts to further complicate the picture. Well, bath salts are an interesting one because I, I don't think people really grasp what that means. And there actually has been legislation in the state of Virginia to outlaw um, the, the purchase or even, I guess, the sale of them. But right. give us a little perspective on what bath salts are and what they do. And well, bath salts, as we know, bath salts right. used to be crystals of salt that you put in your bath. So they were magnesium salts or sodium chloride salts, and you put them in your bath, and then you'd have a nice bath. Well, these bath salts are not those bath salts. So these bath salts come in very small little containers and they're very expensive. So they're little um, packets, maybe this big, and you buy them for $20, $40, right? So not the big jars of big crystals of bath salts right. to start with. So the name is just a random name. Bath salts themselves are actually a type of amphetamine. Mm -hmm. They're a cathinone, which is the same amphetamine that is in cot. Now, cot is a green leafy plant that's used in Yemen and Ethiopia and Somalia as part of their regular culture. But 
if you take those cathinones and you chemically synthesize them, you get a much purer amphetamine-like drug. And you, if you're going to synthesize it, why not change all the parts so that it's not illegal? Because as you change the chemical structure, it hasn't become illegal yet, so it's legal. Um, so the country has, I mean, the, the FDA has come up with some forms of the cathinones that are illegal, that are Schedule I. Mm. And different states have come up with other ones that are Schedule I. But there's any number of variations that you can create in the laboratory. And so, you know, those are not and completely somehow illegal. And find out about it and find it compelling. Y yes, and, and well, it's others. all over the internet. And so it's not hard to find. Right. And they're pretty dangerous as they well, are. Well, they are. They're stimulants. Uh, you know, a little like you might think of a, um, a cocaine overdose or a methamphetamine overdose or, you know, a serious caffeine overdose. Right. Any well, of those, look any of those drugs. Uh, containers there uh, certainly. Uh, <laughs> Uh, they've come to the marketplace, uh, I guess, uh, starting with Starbucks. Uh, let's just get a little charge beyond Starbucks. We can't quite uh, chew enough coffee beans. So now they get uh, a variety of caffeinated products uh, over the counter. Sure, and, and they advertise, they market those specifically towards yeah. the adolescents. The adolescents really think that, you know, I have a teenage son at home, and he came to me one day and said, but really, aren't those kind of good for you because they have vitamins in them? And, you know, these are vitamins we get from our regular food, and they have caffeine in them, like coffee, only I don't think people really understand the amount of caffeine they're drinking. You know, if they were, if they read the label and they tried to figure it out, a lot of the labels don't actually have the number of milligrams of caffeine. But at least to, to understand what you're doing. You know, a lot of the youngsters will knock back, you know, three or four of these, they're tiny, why not? Um, and then wonder why they have palpitations and they have chest pain and they're very anxious and they're tremulous. And can't sleep. Can't, oh, definitely can't, can't sleep. Can't but they don't want to sleep anyway. So. Right. <laughs> but what's interesting is that a lot of them say they're caffeine-free, but they have analogs or things that are related right. to caffeine that act in the same way. So they call them something different. To like exactly. They say they're caffeine-free, but they have guarana yeah, or guarana, yerba mate. Right. Yeah. Exactly, and those basically are caffeine or theobromine, which acts on the cells just like caffeine does. Right. So those combinations that look more innocent just because you don't know what the chemicals are really aren't much more innocent. That's right. And, uh, and they find lots of interesting things, but I would also imagine that there's a big element here also of, uh, let's say, uh, symbolic ingestions. <clears throat> I know as a pediatrician I will more often see uh, suicide gestures uh, with someone taking 20 Advil, knowing or right. feeling, well, I've taken this two or three at a time, it couldn't really do much more to me and it's available, but if I go in and tell my parents, they know that I'm serious about something. Um, <clears throat> the problem is when they make a mistake. When they make a mistake. Right, so they think that it's, you know, something safe, two or three of something safe, and it, it could be two or three of something that could actually kill them. Right. So, and that's, <clears throat> I'm sure, a very difficult one. So when you see kids who come in obtunded, you're treating them in the ER probably all the time, and you're figuring, well, let's check that blood alcohol level, and all of a sudden that comes back negligible. Then what do you do? Well, clock screen, it's another test, but depending upon <coughs> what your lab actually runs, is it clock screen, is it blood, is it urine, you may or may not get the complete picture. So we. We have to put the signs and symptoms together with the, the frame of reference, including the poison control center, and sometimes we need luck to figure into our success I would imagine, as well. Yes, I, a, lot of, uh, a lot of outcomes are dependent on luck and, and timing. Um, but I'm sure that that's a, a pretty significant challenge in the ER when, when you get someone drunk or someone obviously inebriated from some other drug and they come in with someone who's barely alive and you try the usuals and they aren't there and then you're sort of stuck trying to figure out what is it, <laughs> what's going on. Uh, and then I would imagine your involvement will be to advise them as to how many different types of things they could screen for. But I think the other part not to be lost <coughs> is that sometimes they come into the emergency department and we will do what we can to stabilize, but we won't have all the final answers, but we know that they're sick enough to go into the intensive care unit. The poison center just doesn't stop at the ER door as they were a reference for us in what we were doing to try and make a patient better. They work with the intensive care units and the other specialty units 
um, to make sure that there is a favorable outcome as well. So you're sort of a supercomputer of, of these various facts, symptoms, presentations, substances, biochemical interactions, all of that sort of thing, and you help to guide uh, physicians in those settings who really wouldn't have that at their fingertips. Exactly. We have a lot of resources available to us, and we have a lot of experience, and the combination of the resources and the experience really helps. Um, in addition, we, we're actually collecting data on the cases that are coming into the Poison Center. We collect that data in real time. We're not really doing it for the purpose of collecting data. We're just collecting it while we're giving information. Mm -hmm. And that database gives us a lot of power in terms of saying, well, okay, what does happen if a child takes 10 milligrams per kilogram of product X or 20 milligrams per kilogram of this product, is it going to be a problem or not? So we have the ability to get answers to questions about toxicity of products that you couldn't really get otherwise because you wouldn't want to do studies on children. So every call that comes in is potentially adding to the repertoire of information that really can help people in the future. It's adding to that database and that database has it has the ability to pick up products that are a problem, especially new products that hit the market, as we saw with the batteries and the 20 millimeter cell emerging. Um, it has the ability to pick up emerging substances of abuse, as we saw with K2 and spice and, and um, the, the uh, bath salts evolving. And we also use it to monitor constantly for chem terrorism events or bioterrorism events so that we're, we're actually looking at our data in real time as it's uploaded to our servers. And we, we specifically monitor for three different things. We, we monitor for the call volume every hour to see if it's an aberrant hour compared to the historical baseline for that particular hour in prior years. We monitor for the clinical effects distribution because we capture data on 131 different clinical effects. So if today we have a lot of diarrhea and bradycardia then compared to what we normally have this time of the year, then we'll say what's causing that particular incident and say if one day we had a lot of um, uh, diarrhea, loss of appetite, fever, and abdominal pain, well that was the day that we learned about salmonella contamination of peanut butter. Uh -huh. Um, so that, that kind of monitoring is constantly going on. And then the last thing we monitor for is specific toxidromes. We're looking for cases of ricin or nerve agents or botulism or cyanide exposures by looking for the combinations of symptoms that, that may occur. So constantly our computers are screening the data. When a case pops up, we get an email that says, take a look. Take a look at this hour. Take a look at this clinical effect. And we map it geographically to see is this a cluster that's all in one county in the region or is it distributed throughout the area? Is this a public health incident? Is this a problem or not? So it's a, a constant activity going on. You've just really elevated the role of the poison center significantly by really giving it that uh, epidemiological and that, that real substantial basis of looking at really what's going on, whether it be a biohazard, some kind of contamination, some kind of food poisoning, I would imagine you'd see the same patterns uh, with certain types of uh, gastrointestinal illnesses secondary to certain foods, like you said, the peanut butter. Now, with the peanut butter, I know that there were, there were I guess, there, well, there was one peanut butter source, or Peter Pan. Peter Peter Pan. Peter Pan. And great value peanut butter. And great value, both from the same contaminated nut source? Uh, or, I believe it was. Yeah. And, of course, probably everybody who ate peanut butter then had imaginary illness. Well, some of Did you get a lot of calls like that? We had a lot of calls, but a lot of these patients had true symptoms. Yes. They, they had fever, which, you know, you can document they had true diarrhea, they had abdominal cramps, and their question to us was really, do I have salmonella or not? And that's not really a question the Poison Center can answer, but what we can do is guide them on which, which of those patients actually need to go to the emergency department and which don't. Right. So that, that triage role is an important one. So you also screen for mass hysteria. At the same time, <laughs> if you're getting a lot of calls and the symptoms just don't fit we actually the diagnosis. We a lot of calming. Yeah. A lot of calming people down, a lot I of telling imagine. people your child's going to be fine. Because we, we can sit there, we can calculate the dose, we can say, you know what, we've seen thousands of kids who've ingested this little bit and they don't have a problem. So we can safely treat uh, the large proportion of people who call us at home. In fact, 66% of the call of the cases that a poison center handles are managed on site. And if the person calls the poison center first, then 85% of those patients will be managed at home and not need a referral to an emergency department. Right. So a lot of what we do is 
not a problem. You can manage this at home. It just requires dilution or it just requires observation or it's really not toxic and you don't need to do anything. Right. Have you ever come upon uh, carbon monoxide poisoning? Sure, all too often, particularly in the winter time. But don't kid yourself, you can see summertime accidents where the gas heater was on for some particular reason and it was faulty, like the situation that Nicole was speaking to, that leads to this otherwise unknown release of a gas that's poisoning you, but without that alarm, you won't recognize it potentially until it's too late. So carbon monoxide is, is a big issue then for the uh, poison center as well. It's a huge issue because it's an odorless gas. You don't know it's there. Um, there's no warning sign, and it's a killer. You know, it's considered the silent killer for a reason, and it kills in groups as well because you have a lot of people living in one facility and they're all exposed to that faulty furnace or that faulty water heater, or you've got a power failure, and um, so people improvise. They bring the charcoal grill indoors something you absolutely never should do. Right. But w so we have a lot of carbon monoxide poisonings associated with power outages, with, with hurricanes, with blizzards. Um, People sitting in their cars, I guess, in snowstorms, not knowing that their exhaust the pipe is pipe covered by the snow. snow. Yeah. And so they end up uh, with uh, trying to stay warm in their car through a period of time when they're waiting in traffic. It, that can be dangerous. So. Uh, People should have carbon monoxide monitors. They should have alarms throughout their house or any place where they're going to be sleeping where they wouldn't be aware. Absolutely, absolutely. So, and, yeah, and the, and the role of the poison center there is, is one, to educate. You know, it's something that poison center, people think of the poison center as a hotline, and yet we actually do a lot of public education as well. We distribute materials and we send them out to every daycare center in the area for every child to take home. Um, we have a poison post, an electronic newsletter that, that hits on a lot of the topics that we're talking about today that people can get free and they can just check on our website, poison.org, or they can email poisonpost at poison.org to, to sign up for this electronic newsletter. Um, we have a website, we have a Facebook um, web you know, pages that are constantly updated with new things that are coming out. What are your Valentine's Day hazards, for example? Right. Um, so there are well, there's lots more that a poison center does, and educating about carbon monoxide is an example. It's just so important that people have a carbon monoxide detector in their home, and to realize that this is really an important, it's an important um, problem. Oh, it's tragic. Uh, the, the stories that you hear about people who innocently are in a house, I mean, certainly I've, I've had a patient, a family where Dad left the car running in the garage, closed the door, left the door open because he was running inside to get some papers and, and to do something that he had to do in the house. He was going to leave, but then he sat down and watched a football game for a few minutes. Next thing you know, everybody's getting sleepy. And fortunately, that disaster was averted, but it doesn't always happen that way. You've really got to use your head when you're thinking about those kinds of things. Um, with a, adults, then, I guess it's more uh, substance, alcohol, um, overdosing or incorrect medication ingestions and more of the environmental occupational kinds of things. And errors, you know, people put things in containers, they'll, they'll try and take a, uh, a cleaning product home from work and they'll put it in a beverage container and set it on a counter and another adult will drink out of it. Or people who don't uh, read or understand English will not be able to read the writing on a poisonous substances container. So that's all problems of adults and, uh, as well. And I would imagine also mixing uh, certain cleaning fluids, uh, the famous one being ammonia and Clorox. But sure, I'm making sure chloramine gas. Right. There are many other things that people do that uh, are quite hazardous, and some that they almost do intentionally, for instance, with uh, Freon and, and some of the other inhalant, the, the uh, whiffing that kids go through, too. But it's not just the poisonings in the sense that we've talked about right. so far that the poison center can be helpful. There was within the past year I was seeing a patient in the ER who had come in with nausea, vomiting, and their face was flushed. And they were um, complaining of numbness of the tongue. Now, was it a stroke? Was it a heart attack? Or no one talking to the patient further, they related they had just eaten fish. And while the fish was reported to be one thing, the signs and symptoms that they were displaying, in fact, were consistent with another type of fish that's known to have those symptoms. So a, 
a call to the Poison Control Center once again, not because it was a purposeful ingestion or a child gone wild, it was just somebody who went to a restaurant that may have eaten something different than what they ordered right. that resulted in their uh, needing an ER visit and their expertise. So are these like the red tie type things? That, exactly. Uh, we're talking yeah. about so either scombroid, yeah. scombroid pie poisoning or ciguatera poisoning. Ciguatera so scombroid poisoning. is when you have a, a dark meat fish right. that is let get warm. And so the, the histidine in the tissues turns to histamine, which is the same thing that people secrete when they have an allergic reaction. So they look for all the world like an allergic reaction. Wow. And then the other one is the ciguatera, which is when the reef fish eat a certain algae Gambard discus toxicus. And they eat this algae and it builds up um, in their, their tissue, but they're little fish. But then when the barracuda eats them, they eat a lot of them. Right. And so the barracuda gets that concentrated toxin, the ciguatera toxin. And then you're told it's Chilean sea bass and it really isn't. Right, maybe it's a big reef fish. <laughs> right. Maybe it's a big barracuda. Right, and, uh, and all of a sudden you're feeling very strange and very sick. But you'd see that in a cluster typically, wouldn't you? Well, it depends. You would if lots of people ate from the same fish, but yeah, if you're here in Washington, okay. D.C., you might only get you know, one person who's eating right. barracuda that night, or you know, you'd expect to see it in a cluster. Right, but I guess really when it comes down to it, most of the time it's one fish for your dish. So right. to speak, and uh, right, you got a dish, and the other person got lamb, and the other one got chicken. So, right, not too many people have barracuda in their backyards. So, so that's a, a pretty incredible, uh, let's say, uh, experience that anybody might have. So th that's another one of the food poisoning kinds of things that you guys uh, would deal with. Uh, you also had mentioned earlier that you do some pet advising. Um, what happens with pets? Uh, I mean, and how do how do people know that they should call you? if they have an issue or concern or question? Well, we do have a lot of resources available. And um, while we're nurses and pharmacists for the most part, not veterinarians on staff, um, we try to help when we can. So if people suspect that their pet has gotten into something, we're happy to field the call. And if it's something that's too complicated for us or we don't have the expertise for it, then we do have other numbers for them to call in terms of the Animal Poison Center or um, other resources that they go to and um, so sometimes we can save them um, a visit to the veterinarian and sometimes not. So. Right. So if they'll get into human medicines and sometimes people figure well if it works for me and you're limping around I'll give you some Advil too. Absolutely, absolutely and that's a big problem that we want to educate people about that um, dogs and cats are not just little people and so we cannot give them the medications that we would normally take ourselves. And so I would strongly advise anyone who um, notices their pet to be either in pain or not their normal selves, limping, something like that, to consult their veterinarian first before dosing them at home with a medication that you would take yourself. And it may end up being appropriate, but you definitely don't know. And you look and you say, oh, you could take one. Oh, you're big, I can take two. But it might be right, significantly right. more. They don't have the same kind of detoxification apparatus right. in their bodies that we might have so they may get an overdose quite easily uh, one of the things that always uh, astounds me is the the reputation that chocolate and dogs absolutely might have can you give us any perspective on that that is one question that we can answer um, pretty consistently and accurately at the poison center for dogs um, we have some good ranges of what is poisonous and what is not. It's best if you happen to know which type of product it was, the amount, even if it's the maximum possible amount. Um, we can do some estimations based on the dog's weight, whether or not we would expect the dog to become poisoned by this, medic or by this product. Um, things that uh, the chocolates can cause in dogs are going to be things like vomiting and diarrhea and tremors. Um, ultimately, if a very large amount is ingested, you can see seizures and death. So it is something that uh, can be very serious in pets. Chewing gum. I know my dog seems to find it no matter where it is in the house. Well, these I, things smell good. And they <laughs> smell good, yes. Yeah, chewing gum is a particular problem for dogs versus people. Um, a lot of times kids will ingest an entire pack of chewing gum and we don't see a whole lot of symptoms. It'll pass through just like, you know, food or Everything foreign else. body, right. yeah. Um, <laughs> but for dogs, the sugar-free type chewing gums are ones that can become um, pretty large problems. 
Um, some of these products contain xylitol, which is an artificial sweetener, and it can cause a drop in blood sugar in dogs that can actually result in things like vomiting and tremors and seizures. And so these are things that need to be taken care of, usually by a veterinarian. Wow, so it's nice to know that there's an additional resource that you can provide, and if you can't give the right advice, you know where to send people for that information. Yes. So you were talking about some of the issues with the, the Poison Center. I know that uh, you say you have huge educational initiatives. You spend a, a lot of money on electronic communications. I mean, looking at uh, uh, the Poison Post, I know there are lots of really, really great uh, little articles there that are, are very timely. Uh, I, I know that uh, I'm sure during the seasonals, like uh, Christmas time, you talk about uh, some of the plant ingestions and, and some of the other potential toxins around the house and things of that nature. Some of the other things that you do really require a lot of professional input, a lot of professional time, and a lot of, uh, of real investment. How do you guys get funded? Um, the Poison Center has an annual budget of about $3 million, and half of that is funded by government grants from Maryland, Virginia, the District of Columbia, and from the federal government. Uh, unfortunately, it's only half, and the reason it's only half is that we've had huge slashes in our funding from all of those sources. Um, Virginia has cut us by 74 percent, Maryland's cut us by 25 percent, and the feds have cut us by about a third over, the la over a two-year period. So we've suffered from this economic downturn, and we have a $1 million deficit in our operating budget this year, and we're projecting that our operating deficit is going to climb to 1.3 or $1.4 million next year. So um, we are, at this point, soliciting philanthropic contributions. We're out there looking for foundation grants. We're trying to get hospitals to help support us with um, donations and users to make donations to the Poison Center, and uh, we're hoping that government will, at some point, have the fiscal ability to turn things around to start funding us again at the level that they were previously funding us, which was you know, adequate to keep the, the center running. Well, it seems like the service you provide is essential, it's crucial, and it's, it's really, uh, it's inexcusable that, that our society can't support something like that. Uh, especially uh, when they're cutting funds and doing things to help save money, but not things that are really helping people that way. And it's, it's a tough situation. So uh, we want to encourage anyone who's interested and able to uh, contribute a few dollars. Certainly on your website, are there places where they can go to uh, contribute? On our website, they can donate electronically or they can mail a contribution to the center. And the address is on the site. Um, you know, the, the importance of poison centers is usually understood by legislators and, and government because it's a service that actually has been demonstrated with at least a dozen health economic studies to save money. Right. So every dollar spent on poison control has been shown from one study to another to save somewhere between $6 and $36 in unnecessary health care costs. So you're avoiding emergency department visits that don't need to happen since we treat most patients at home. You're avoiding ambulance transports. You're avoiding some hospitalizations. And most recently, we have data to show that poison center involvement decreases the length of stay for cases. So and we all know that once you walk into a hospital, <laughs> there's a whole new world of risk that uh, will occur. So I also know that looking at the website, you have incredible lists of preventive opportunities to help people set up their households and, and understand exactly what they, they can do to at least set themselves up. We've talked about carbon monoxide monitoring. We've talked about sure. noting what's in your pill bottles, making sure that uh, things are out of reach, are securely uh, put away in ways that our kids can't get to them. And um, I would imagine even having little protocols around the house would be helpful, especially if you have the sitter there with your kids. Um, it's, it's a really remarkable service that you provide. And I really admire and, uh, and thank you all for being there to do this. And I hope that you've had some opportunity to learn a bit about some of the things that might be uh, of danger in your own house and how to handle those things and that you have access to information and to some really dedicated uh, professionals. 
I thank you for watching, and you know, I'll be thinking of the next show, and until that time, I'm Dr. Russell Libby, looking out for your health. 1-800-222-1222 If you think it might be poison, then the first thing you should do is call 1-800-222-1222 Poison is the kind of thing you're not supposed to touch Old prescriptions, cleaning stuff, or spider bites and such If you swallowed something bad or think you took too much Call the Poison Control Santa Hotline We're the people you can trust For poison emergencies or just questions The Poison Control Center Hotline is here 24-7 with the expert help you need Free and confidential We hope you never need us, but keep our number by the phone 1-800-222-1222